Hi, today we are so excited to have the founder of Urban Bushwomen, Jawale Willa Joe Zoller. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very excited to be here. And we, because you've done so much, the title is a little bit longer for this Raising the Bar segment. Dream big, realizing a vision through founding a company and choreographing an opera. So we're going to start at the end of the title today. And please tell us a little bit about Intelligence, this fabulous new, newish opera production. Well, um, Intelligence is composed by Jake Heggie and the librettist is Jean Shear. And they contacted me in 2018 about directing and choreographing this new opera about these two women, primarily, I would say three women, but um, about Elizabeth Van Loo, who was a real person, um, who was a spy for the Union Army living in the seat of the Confederacy in Richmond, and uh, a young woman, Elizabeth, uh, Mary Jane, who she had raised after her mother had died. And once Elizabeth had uh, emancipated, freed all of the people who were enslaved on, on her plantation she inherited from her father, Elizabeth, she raised, Elizabeth raised uh, Mary Jane and sent her off to the North to be educated. Um, and when she came back to Richmond, she was, she was uh, basically put into the Confederate White House as, as, an, as a slave. That part's controversial, so whether it's true or not, but in our story, it was true. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what, I, what I love about this story um, and love that it got made is it's resurrecting the history of these extraordinary women that we wouldn't otherwise yeah. know about um, yeah. and the extraordinary bravery that it must have taken. And also the fact that their their uh, stratagem, their deception succeeded because nobody really, quote, saw them. Right. Yeah, I think that the Elizabeth Van Loo, everyone thought she was just a crazy eccentric um, spinster was the word that was often used. And, and then I think for Mary Jane, you know, you know, the people didn't see her. And then who would suspect that this was happening. I, there are people who suspected her, but she was elusive. I mean, she was smart. She was elusive. Um, and she really had a very organized system of getting intelligence, which is where the title comes from, yep. uh, from the, from the sources around her, from the Confederate white house, from, from all of the, you know, the sources that were around her to the union army. Um, in our piece, it was uh, often she, she used a red flag on the line to say that this this uh, we have intelligence. We know that it was sometimes baked in the bread. What? We, yeah, there, there was sometimes baked, there might be something that was baked in the bread and bread is passed off, or sometimes it might've been put in an egg. There'd be a basket of eggs and one had a little, the, the yolk had been sucked out. And, um, it, it, in this case, she it was she also sewed it into the the hems and different parts of, of fabric uh, of uh, dresses that were the, the seamstress shop was a part of this ring that then could be handed off in terms of the intelligence. That is amazing. I've, I've just been doing some reading and I was thinking of, of some of the books I've been reading, A Woman of No Importance um, and some other ones about women spies in World War II. And um, mm -hmm. these men just, uh, particularly the Nazis, just couldn't conceive that women would be smart enough or gutsy enough um, or intelligent, to use your word, enough um, to be spies. So I'm fascinated that these their downfall was their inability to actually see these women. Um, and if I remember correctly, a docent came up to the director and said, you need to know about these two women. And instead yeah. of just blowing this person off, he said he went and Googled, right? Yeah, this is Jake and Jean, a docent at the Smithsonian came up to them, they were there for an event and said, I've got a great idea for um, an opera. And if, you know, in this world, you know, a lot of people come up to you and say, oh, I've got a great idea for a dance. Or, you know, like, oh, yeah, that's great, that's great. But in this case, 
it was really intriguing and the docent waited to really relay this information. So, you know, you never know where, where these things are gonna come from. But once Jake and Jean learned about uh, Elizabeth Van Loo and Mary Jane, they then did deeper research and became captivated by the story. And it, and it just sounds extraordinary. Um, I want to turn to your role. Um, you're quoted as saying, opera, me, question um, mark. How, how did these um, two folks come to you? And your first reaction is me. And then why did you accept it? And, and what were you trying to bring to the production? I, the interesting thing is I had been talking about for a long time, I want to get into the opera world. I'm really interested. I thought it would be like a little small entrance as a choreographer on a smaller experimental opera, and then I would maybe work my way up. So when I got the email, it was the email from Jake in 2018, I was like, whoa, this is I mean, this is big. Me, like, I mean, it was just kind of overwhelming because it, it wasn't the ladder that I imagined. Yeah. This is starting, like, at the top. Yeah, and, and so often women uh, choreographers, particularly women of color, have have to work and work and work, and, and if they push ahead, it's this much. Yeah. I mean, it's not like that you haven't spent decades forming a company, et cetera, and, and a number of different initiatives but the way you talked about it it was it sounded so exciting to me um what well, what did you say um now we can really now we can fully realize our vision yeah now we can create something new and i was like oh that's wonderful and i've you know i've been creating things new for a long time with music theater dance music theater work uh like i said often that the ability to think on a grand scale wasn't there. Yep. So when I first questioned like opera, whoa, this is big. Um, I don't know, you know, if I'm ready, if I'm right. Uh, and a friend of mine said, no, 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 you, your work has been about connecting dance to music, to storytelling, to, um, to the whole, the, the theatrical, you just couldn't work on a, on, a, on the, the, the layers and level of opera, but it's been a practice that you've been in from the very beginning of the company. And once I understood that, that in like one of the early works, the very first work I did was uh, one work called River Songs. And then on, on it was a shared bill and it was another work called a Spula, which was a dream word by the composer and worked with a composer. We had songs, we had people singing, we had movement, we had, um, live percussion. So on the smallest scale, yeah. that was there. And then as it moved into the works praise house and um, womb wars and but you know, so the, the practice was there, the learning was there, the, the, the interest in, I wanted to tell, or I want to tell stories through music theater and dance, but I'm not interested in musicals. And so what, okay. what I liked about opera as different than a musical, uh, and I shouldn't say this, that I'm not interested in musical, that's not the work that I was making. Opera allows for an interrogation of emotion that, that, that unfolds and unfolds and unfolds and it gets bigger and it goes down and it gets bigger, it goes down. And that was the critique I often had of my work is that like, it's too big and emotional and then it looks like it's gonna end, but then it goes back up and it looks like it's gonna end. So <laughs> opera felt like a better kind of connection. I mean, some of the Sondheim work kind of falls into that Yes, kind of yes, 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 absolutely. But the bigness of opera and the bigness of the emotions and that you don't have to pull that back and Amen. restrain it unless you want to, but it's in the form, it's inherent in the form that that is very much a part of the form. And that's been very much a part of my work, big emotion. So that, so that totally makes sense. And yes, as a fan of opera, what I love about it is it's everything. It's mm -hmm. 
amazing costumes. It's ridiculous over the top plots. It's strong women. I mean, um, you know, I live for art, Visa Darte, and then she stabs the guy. <laughs> uh, it's awesome. And so it that totally makes sense to me. The other thing that that I thought was really interesting that you said you were talking about the use of dancers and um I guess it was Jean said look I don't want to have just essentially what you were talking about bring the dancers on they do a little thing and then they leave. Yeah. He really wanted to weave and integrate um the dance into the work and you you described if I remember that the dancers you wanted them to be want them to be a spiritual force. Yes. I, um I is, was, and will. And I yeah. thought that was brilliant. It's almost like a, both a connective tissue, but also a moral thread and sort of a baseline to hold the work. Absolutely. When, when, when uh, Gene talked about he wanted these spirits, the dancers to be the spirits, I honestly was sitting there and I, like when I can't get a visual, I can't get an idea, then I know there's something I have to interrogate about that. So okay. he was saying these spirits and, I'm, and I thought spirits was, was very, um, it was a general idea. So when I renamed them the is, was, will, then it gave, it gave a, I suddenly had a visual idea of these are people, spirits who've always been, always will be, and are here in the now. And that's very much consistent with an African cosmology of the world, that the past, present, and future exist together in the same time. And maybe we're going to, at some point, understand the connection between Einstein's theory oh, exactly. and, 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 what, and what many cultures say is a truth. Yeah, I mean, space-time continuum folds back on itself, yeah, right? exactly. string theory and all that stuff that I sort of understand for five minutes and then I lose it. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, co the cosmogram from Congo, and then you yes. also match mentioned, I thought this was, I don't know a thing about it, but I'm fascinated now, the African writing system. Um, yeah. And how do you pronounce that? I'm not sure, but I, I pronounce it in Sabidi. I don't know if that's okay. actually. Well, you, yeah, um, there's, there's a book that I read, um, I think it was in the late 70s when it came out, called Flash of the Spirit by Robert Ferris Thompson. He was a, a scholar and teacher at Yale, and his interest, interest was in African and African-American cosmologies and art. And he had a book, Art in Motion, as well. And so when I first read that's where I first read about the four moments of the sun, the Congo cosmogram, and the Insabiti writing. And I was fascinated because like a lot of people, there's a mythology that Africa didn't, there weren't writing systems, there were, you know, that you know, there weren't these um highly sophisticated ways of maintaining culture and 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 philosophical concepts that undergirded how how um a community or society would move forward. And when I started reading about this, and it was just so powerful and seeing how it embedded in African-American culture as well, that I just never forgot it. And I, 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 I always return to it uh, because it's such, it grounds me in a way to think about this, this cosmogram and this writing that, you know, within the African continent, there's, there's a tradition of secret societies. Yes. Yes. And, and, and and coded language and coded ideas. And they exist here in the U.S. It also exists here in the U.S. It's a little bit different in the manifestation, but it's also what in, um, really intrigued me about the first time I saw and learned about the Mardi Gras Indians was all of this coding in their gestures and coding in their costumes. And it, it's like, to me, a carryover of the secret society. Yep. So I, I wanted... I wanted the dancers to be both this visible force where you can see them, but also knowing that they're carrying an unseen, unknowable, coded language. And that became through movement. Ooh, I love that. I was, I was looking at a couple of the images and the women were sort of connected like this. It was like a chain of experience or chain of lineage. I'm, I'm just 
like making this up, but that's what it felt like to me. It was both fragile mm -hmm. and incredibly strong. And it was based on these women connecting to each other. Yeah, you know, the interesting thing is that when I'm doing a project, I, I have some system of collecting images. Um, and right now I use something called Milanote, but I sometimes, I sometimes I do it as a PowerPoint or a notebook where I just, and I had an image of spider's web and I had no, I mean, I, if I'm attracted to an image, I don't have to know why I just collect it. And, um, then when I started to really look at this story, I thought, boy, there's so much entanglement. It's so much of a web of weaving of entanglements and, truth and, and, and hidden truths. Um, and so then the spider web became um, more of it, like I wanted to create a dance of entanglements. It was like a spider's web, this weaving. And then Jake uh, and Jean created this beautiful song in the second act. So what that I called, uh, it's, 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 it's a song that's the words are, if I'm, if I if I'm um, if I do this thing, I will be chained to you forever. Ah, to you forever. So my fate will be with your fate. And so then we looked at that and to start to play with this idea of a dance of entanglements and sorrow. And then later it became also the sorrow of the horrors of war. Yeah. But 800,000 people died in the Civil War, black, white, women, children, et cetera. So and many these, things. These horrors of war keep repeating, and we're in it now. Indeed. Um, and that whatever, like you could think, I'm on this side or that side, there's a horror and, and devastation and destruction that is, that, you know, that that is you know, it's, it's unfathomable. So it also then became one of the characters, Travis, who was home guard is, is killed. And it's not like so much the, a mourning for him, but a mourning for what we do when we're either forced or jump into these conflicts where yeah. taking of human life becomes just ordinary. Ex so, it's, it's opposed to extraordinary. Yes, yes. So I, I'm I'm sitting here, and there's a bunch of Greek classics behind me. Mm -hmm. um, and when I read um, um, the classics when I was in school, I thought it was sort of this worship of warrior heroes. And the more I go back and read it now, particularly as a mother of a son who would, I realize it's an incredible anti-war document. Um, and mm -hmm. I think very often women are the ones who tell those stories. Yes. I want to flip it a little bit um, because we were talking about the bigness of this work um, and I'm right there with you. I want women, particularly women of color, to have the opportunity to make big, big works because I think in part we learn new movements, we understand things differently, we hear different stories or it may be a story we've heard before, but you it's a completely different emotion, different way of looking at things. Um, and I golly, I can I can name so many examples. How did it feel to go big? You said that you were ter terrified and excited, which I think is brilliant. And I think particularly women over 60 should have that more. Right. Oh, absolutely. I'm with you on that. I, I think, you know, there, there were a lot of learning curves. So. The translation from the rehearsal in the room to the opera house, to the opera stage, that for me was like a huge aha. Because what worked in the room, once it's now on this huge stage of 3,000 seat house. Yep. Um, it's like, oh, that doesn't work. And that doesn't work. <laughs> and I think I was so shocked because um, we had a good room run as our last rehearsal in the room. And I was feeling really good. You know, there were a few things here and there, but I was feeling yep. really good about what was happening. And then we got to the stage and I like, oh no, nothing's working. And I just- Because it didn't um, feel big enough or the geometry of it didn't work or what, what was I it? I think some of it was the geometry of it. I think some of it was the 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 scale of the set 
and it did not move as quickly as we had been rehearsing. Uh -huh. So we were moving, we were rehearsing that it, it would move at a certain speed and it was not moving at that speed. Yep, yep. <laughs> it's so, the little things that aren't so little, right? <laughs> And then also then the way of seeing it, because in the rehearsal studio, you're right up on it. And then seeing it and knowing that it has to project really far away, then you're seeing things that, oh, that needs to be more here. That needs, so it was it was a, a big learning. It's not the first time I've had that learning a lot, particularly when I'm rehearsing and you're right up on the work, then uh -huh. you're in the intimacy of it. And then you get it on the stage and then you're, you're in a landscape kind of view of it. And, but this on the scale of what didn't work, I had never experienced before. And I really, at one point I was like, oh, I've just completely and utterly failed. And this is where the team at Houston Grand Opera was amazing. And I want to talk about that because it sounds like you got full throated support all the way through. Absolutely. You traveled to do the research. I mean, it sounds in some ways like a dream commission because they weren't saying, oh, we told you you could have this, but you can't have this. Or you've only got a half an hour rehearsal time here. It sounds like it was full on full faith and credit. And let's make this thing work. Absolutely. Corey uh, is just amazing. Uh, and and the, like the, the stage management team was all women. Yay! Uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the the director of productions was a woman, uh, you know, so, so. It, I mean, I that's just, really unusual in the opera world. I have to say, oh my goodness. I mean, and so it was all of these women that I really felt like with Jake and Jean were like, you can do it. You can do it. Pay attention to this. Um, you know, you know, that is not working there, <laughs> you know, and offering suggestions about, you know, what, you know, what might you know, what might happen or what, what could be some solutions. And then my, my team of the associate choreographer, Vincent Thomas, the associate director, Coulter Schoenfish. Coulter works in the opera world. So there's certain kinds of staging, like the staging of singers. That for me was like, oh, I this is like a really, I know about staging dancers and actors and a certain kind of actor. Sure. I'm used to working with actors who are very experimental and discovery focused. So you go through the character, you go through the um, table work, and then I then I like to let them play and yep. like different choices. But in opera, it's like really, really, I and mean, there's not a lot of room or time to, yep. that, that's not their practice is to play. Well, certainly they haven't been taught that. And even old school park and bark, you know, you yes. show up, you stand there and I understand why they do it. I mean, their legs are yes. wide, they're grounding yes. themselves. And then this almost like geyser of sound comes yes. out to yes. change that, to make the move while they're doing that. That's probably, if I were an opera singer, I, because what I'm primarily worried about is my voice. I'd be like, what are you yes. doing to me? Right. Yes. And that, and that, and I think that was legitimate when that started coming up or like when I was saying, well, just explore and then find, you know, and then, then when I see something, you know, I'll say yes. And that, that exploratory place, it's, it's just, you know, it's just a different practice. And I had to learn to understand that that wasn't their practice and what they wanted was much more specificity of I want you to do this, 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 this. And it's just not the way that I work. The specificity becomes there, but we discover it together. Together. Yep. And and that's, you know, so that that was a that was a big learning for me. And that's why Coulter uh being on the team because he was much more adept at that than ah. than I was. I'm I'm really used to a discovery process of working within the room and trying, you know, 20 different versions or ideas of something before landing. And that's a very different process. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. It sounds almost like more like ballet, like just tell me what to do. Exactly. Right. And, and, but these are your artists and you have to make them comfortable to a certain extent. 
one of the things that I wanted to ask you about is, did you go into the pit, up to the second balcony, over to the left, over to the right, in the back to sort of see how things looked? No, I, I, a little bit to the back. I wish I'd have gone up to the second balcony. I felt like I was, I felt like I was chained to the tech table. Sure, I bet. <laughs> and uh, other people were going up, but I, I, I think it, you know, given the opportunity to do it again, I would make that much more of a priority um, to do because I, you know, I felt, I just felt kind of chained to the tech table with the projections. I also. I also learned that in a lot of opera, they don't use projections as much. That's becoming, it's using more scenic elements. Yep. And projections take a lot more time because for the visual storytelling in connection with the light levels, in connection with, you know, the movement of the set. So I felt like that chained me to the tech table a little bit more than I think I normally am. We usually um, ask our Raising the Bar faculty members to do a checklist of deliverables. So I'm, I'm not going to make you do it now. Um, but if you if you immediately thought of like three to five things, um, you know, in terms of what the surprises are, what the cool things are, but what the surprises are, um, it sounds like working with singers. I mean, give me, give me sort of. Well, a I would little... definitely say working with opera singers because I've worked a lot with jazz singers and singers, other kinds of singers Fair enough. that right. also come out of experimental theater. Yeah. So, so working with opera singers who were amazing, but understanding more what they needed, that was definitely a learning. The translation from the room to a huge stage and opera house. That was um, a big learning. And then the how the set elements and and uh, the, the set lighting and projections that that takes a lot more time. And you know in theater you often have at least in the theater that I've experienced, you have a little bit more time in the theater to work those things out. Okay. Than you do an opera. Um, and so I was used to having more time to work it out. It's like, Oh, okay. This is now, <laughs> um, you know, there's no preview period, so to speak, or, uh, you know, things like that where you're in the theater for two weeks or, you know, a week. Tweak this, tweak that. Yeah. And then, and then at the, I was already prepared for, cause I, I had, I interviewed some people. I said, okay, this is new for me in opera. What are, what are the things that are going to surprise me? What are the things I should know? And they all said, once you go into the dress rehearsal, it's the maestro show. It that is. is a great point. And it's, it's, it's amazing that you actually asked for help, asked for it instead of just saying, I got it all. So that, I think that's, no, really I went around and interviewed people and, you know, it's like, okay, what do I need to know? You know, like what, I mean, I did a lot of research on yep. that because I knew it was new and that, you know, everyone said, it's, you know, be prepared. And there's places where the maestro, you, you know, you may have a different interpretation than the maestro, for me, in this being my first opera, yep. it was a default to the composer and the maestro. Okay. You know, for me in this, I defaulted to what, this is the first time it going up, to what they were seeing and hearing, then how could I make that work? Maybe with, you know, with experience and time that I might be like, no, I, you, know, you know, I would maybe push another vision, uh, vision sure. but I didn't feel that I knew enough uh, of of understanding what they were wanting from the voice, I'm used to, like like with some of the singers I work with, try that like moving and doing this, and it's okay for them to be winded. The tone doesn't have to be as precise. There's another thing happening. So, yep. And I, in jazz is improvisational, right? Absolutely. So that is in their DNA, right? On absolutely. a cellular level. Level. If you tried to make them stand still and do it just one way every single time, they'd probably revolt, right? Yeah. I mean, there's some, I mean, if it's, you know, there's certain things that are written, they can do that. But the yeah. whole the whole beauty of jazz is the improvisation. So Jake gave a lot of permission for them to really feel and embody. 
And so did the the Ryan, uh, uh, Kwame Ryan. He was an incredible conductor, just absolutely incredible conductor. And so I was learning from how they were nuancing and giving permission uh, for, th you know, for things. And then if I did have an idea that was really different, it was really going to them first and saying, you know, th this kind of feels to me, uh, it was a, res for me, it was respect because I'm still in a learning period. Yep. And I, maybe, maybe that's what women do a little bit more, both it's, it can be also, it, it's, it can be a, a powerful thing, but it, it may be sometimes we default a little bit too much. Yep. But I think for me, it was important to learn uh, before I throw the, you know, before I challenge and want to just tear everything apart, I need to understand what it is. So then when I'm tearing it apart, I know what and why I'm tearing it apart. So there's going to be a next time, it sounds like. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, you like that. You like the process. Um, so I personally have been um, trying to champion female choreographers in opera for some time. So I've worked with the lyric. This will be my third time. So Stephanie Martinez um, and uh, Camille Brown, who's yes. on her second one. So uh, first fire shut up in my bones, which was the most fun I've ever had at the opera and most exciting. Now cham um, she's also doing champions and then yeah. a new version of Aida and talk about a big scale. I don't know if yeah. you've ever seen, I mean, you know, not just one elephant, but like herds of elephants coming on stage. Yeah. How did it feel for you when the um, when the curtain went up and there's your vision in just oh huge. my god, huge? How did that feel? I. Uh, it's like when you feel something miraculous has happened but you worked for the miracle to happen. <laughs> so it wasn't, just, it didn't just go, but it's also like when to see it, like I think the opening image and where the way that we went through a lot of iterations of that opening image. And then when finally saw it and saw it working with the way the dancer was upstage of the scrim and the singer was downstage of the scrim and the setup of these two different worlds of those who are living and those who are in the spiritual forces realm. And just that for me was just magical. And yeah. That's, that's just so great. great. Thank you so much. This has been a just I, I don't know. I feel like I've been, I don't know, fizzed up with joy. It's just so wonderful. I hope I get a chance to see the opera. Thank you so much for taking the time to do it. Um, and we're we're really excited to see what's coming next for you. So please well, let us yeah. know. <laughs> well, we'll you know, we'll have to we'll have to feature it and promote it. And it's it's just incredibly exciting. And maybe who knows, maybe warmth of other suns will actually get made into an opera, right? <laughs> Yes, I would love to be on that. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, thank you so thank very you. much. What an honor. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Take care.